This week on the Lectures in History podcast, University of Maryland history professor Michael Ross discusses the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial. The trial was an American legal case from July 10th to July 21st, 1925, in which a high school teacher, John T. Scopes, was accused of violating Tennessee's Butler Act. That act made it illegal for teachers to teach human evolution in any state-funded school. The lecture discusses teaching evolution in 1920s America. This is the first of a two-part lecture. This is Rachel from C-SPAN's podcast team. And before we get to this week's episode, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Jen. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, I'm Jen, one of the producers here at C-SPAN. And if you enjoy lectures in history, we think you'll also like reading our weekly American History TV newsletter. If you're into history, you'll appreciate being an American History TV insider. Every week we deliver advanced program highlights so you never miss out on learning more about the people and events that document the American story. It's the place to find out which lectures in history, Civil War battle talks, features on the presidency, and interviews with historians are coming up. Plus, you'll get highlights of featured C-SPAN podcasts. Subscribe today at c-span.org slash connect for your weekly dose of history every Friday. Thanks for being part of our community. Don't forget to visit c-span.org slash connect to sign up. We got another day of NBA action. And with FanDuel, every night is a watch party. So it's time for your FanDuel crew to make their bets. So, what's the move tonight, gang? You know that new customers who bet $5 get $200 back in bonus bets if you win. Yeah, Woohoo! We're heating up, fam. He just can't miss tonight. Bet all the stars with all your friends and make every moment more only on FanDuel. New customers bet $5, get $200 back in bonus bets if you win. Make every moment more with FanDuel. It goes down in the deal. It goes down. It goes down in the deal. 21 plus and present in Iowa. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-BETS-OFF. The most exciting part of a vacation stay at a home rental? Easy. It's being greeted upon arrival with a rusted lockbox affixed to the underside of a stranger's condo. Yeah, you simply twist knobs, click gears, jiggle it, and then rip it off its moorings, and voila! Your prize is a key to a questionable home rental and maybe tetanus. When you just want to get your vacation started by actually getting into your room, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we deliver your key right to your phone on the Hilton Honors app. Hilton for the stay. Welcome back. For our C-SPAN viewing audience, this is History 134, Spies, Assassins, Martyrs, and Witches, Famous Trials in American History. This is a Gen Ed Big Questions course, and we have a room full of largely non-history majors from the sciences and business and other places who are taking a history course. And the trial we are covering today is a trial that will be dubbed in the 20th century the trial of the century, the Scopes trial. And I want to start our discussion by introducing you to this man. This is John Washington Butler. And he was a Tennessee tobacco farmer who gets elected to the state legislature in 1922. And as he told it, He was home at his Baptist church, and his preacher told a story that he found very disturbing. And it was the story of a local young woman who attended the University of Tennessee, and there was exposed to Darwin's teachings on evolution in a biology course. And she had been raised in a culture of faith and belief in the Bible, And the preacher said she came home from college an atheist. And Butler had three young boys who were growing up. And he knew that evolution was also included in the curriculum of the local high schools. And he did not want to see the same thing happen to his children. So he authored a bill that will pass the Tennessee legislature that will be known as the Butler Act, and it will be an act that prohibited the teaching 
of evolution in any schools that receive state funding. Under the argument of parents should have a say as to what's taught in the schools. They're writing the checks. They should have a say. And Darwin's teachings certainly seem to some to contradict the story of the creation of the universe and the earth in the book of Genesis, the Adam and Eve story. And Darwin was telling a very different tale of the origins of man. And the Tennessee statute, don't copy this down, just get the idea here, is not going to say that you had to teach the book of Genesis in school. All it said is this, that it shall be unlawful for any teacher in any of the universities, normals, normals are schools that taught teachers how to teach, and all other public schools of the state, which are supported in whole or part by the public school funds of the state, to teach any theory that denies the story of divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. So you could teach evolution about other species, but just not anything that conflicted with the book of Genesis. You didn't have to teach the book of Genesis, you just had to, couldn't teach anything that conflicted with it, which would be Darwin's theories on the origins of man. The Butler Act. And it's going to pass. There's going to be some opposition when it's in the Tennessee Senate. There's some Vanderbilt students up in the rafters heckling. But nevertheless, it's going to pass with a lot of enthusiasm and be signed into law by Governor Austin P. Now, it's going to be tricky because the state-mandated biology textbook, Hunter's Civic Biology, did include significant discussions of Darwin's theories of evolution, chapter 14 in particular. So the state science teachers now will have to carefully use the school's textbook so as not to run afoul of the law. And this law, which was part of kind of a growing anti-evolution movement in a number of portions of the country, caught the eye of an organization founded in 1920 called the American Civil Liberties Union. Many of you have heard of them before. They're still around today. And the ACLU was an organization formed around World War I during what is known to historians as the Red Scare, when lots of people with beliefs sympathetic to socialism and communism or anarchism were arrested for the things that they were saying and doing. And the ACLU was created by folks on the American left to defend the First Amendment rights of those people. But it had started to kind of broaden its position. And as many of you know, the ACLU over the course of the 20th century will become First Amendment defendants of a lot of different types of speech. They're going to defend the rights of Nazis to speak, and Klansmen to speak, and the Westboro Baptist Church to speak, under the idea that that's what free speech is all about. The best place to, to expose is to expose ideas to the marketplace of ideas, and then let bad ideas be defeated. And the ACLU saw this law as an infringement of free speech, and now we'll start to put articles into papers in Tennessee saying we need a teacher who wants to challenge this law. And in the Chattanooga Times in 1925, don't copy this down, I'll show you, this article ran. And it says, a legal test of the Tennessee law prohibiting the teaching of evolution in public schools and colleges is being sought by the American Civil Liberties Union. And then down here, we are looking for a Tennessee teacher who is willing to accept our services in testing this law in our courts, in the courts. Our lawyers think a friendly test case can be arranged without costing a teacher his or her job. 
Now let's move our focus to a small town, population 2200, between Knoxville and Chattanooga, known as Dayton, Tennessee, which is going to become quite famous for the events here that unfold. And we're going to move to the local drugstore in town, a drugstore owned by Frank Robinson, a member of the Ray County School Board, where they also sold Hunter Civic Biology for students to buy for use in school, and where there regularly was meetings over coffee and conversation of some of the town's leaders, the local city attorney, some of the managers of the local coal mine, and Frank Robinson himself. And they were discussing this law. And some of them thought it was a silly or wrong law, including a man named George Rappelier, who was a transplanted New Yorker who had a PhD in chemical engineering and was a manager at the local coal mine, which had been struggling a bit. He was a modernist Methodist, and we'll discuss shortly what that means to be a modernist. But he thought the law was silly. But he was also someone who wanted to get some publicity for Dayton. A lot of people didn't know Dayton existed. And he wanted to do something that would put Dayton, as he put it, on the map. There's the drugstore. And as he said to Frank Robinson, we're always looking for something that will get data and a little publicity. Have you seen the morning paper? And he convinces his fellow guys down there to try that maybe this is the place where we do the test case against this law. Maybe we can recruit one of our local school teachers to be the one to challenge this law. And he gets the other folks to say, yeah, all right, maybe let's do this. And he's going to contact the ACLU and say, do you mean what you say? Will you provide lawyers? And they say, absolutely. There they are again. And they're convinced that this is not only going to bring publicity to Dayton, that it's going to bring crowds, that people will want to see this trial, and it will be good for business. And they're going to speak to some of the school teachers. And they're going to find one they think is perfect. He doesn't have a lot of ties to the community. He doesn't have a family. So if he somehow lost his job over this, which they're hoping he wouldn't, he wouldn't, you know, he didn't, he'd be OK. And he was the 24-year-old general science instructor and the football coach who accepted the theory of evolution, but he was no expert. He had taught three weeks as the substitute in the biology class that spring. And he had taught out of Hunter Civic Biology. And he will say that, yes, I probably taught evolution, although he couldn't remember exactly. But he agrees to participate, to be the test case to challenge this law. And Scopes was the son of agnostics. Agnostics, as many of you know, are people who do not say there is no God, but they also say, I don't know if there is. All we can tell about the world is what we see in the material phenomenon on Earth. So I'm not going to rule it out, but I'm not certain. And Scopes he also claimed to be an agnostic, although he attended Dayton's Methodist Church largely for social reasons in a small town that was a good place to meet people and feel to be part of a community. But he's now going to attach his name to a famous case challenging the Butler Act. Now this class watched, as an introduction to this, the fictionalized account of these events in Hair at the Wind, where they do this dramatic story of Scopes being arrested in front of the classroom. That's not what's happening here. This is a created test case. There he is. And amongst the folks at Frank Robinson's drugstore 
was the local city attorney, Sue Hicks, and he agrees to be part of it. He agrees to prosecute Scopes, who's admitted to having taught evolution in violation of the Butler Act out of Hunter's Civic Biology. And he goes down to a local justice of the peace and has them swear out a warrant for Scopes' arrest. And Scopes is arrested. The editor of the Baltimore Sun, a supporter of the teaching of evolution, is going to be intertwined with the ACLU on this. And he'll pay Scopes' his bail. And Scopes goes off to play tennis. In the movie version, he's sitting behind bars. That's not true. Goes off to play tennis. Now, I love these guys at Fred Robinson's, at Frank Robinson's uh, drugstore, and I'll tell you why. This class, for our C-SPAN viewers, is a class that focuses on trials that were well known at the time, sensational at the time, and still have a hold on the American imagination today, but that have no precedential value. I teach a course on constitutional history where we do landmark cases, Marbury versus Madison and Brown v. Board, et cetera. But Scopes is a trial that's not going to set a lot of precedent, but still everybody knows, and everybody knew at the time. People in Europe knew the Scopes trial. And those guys at the drugstore knew they were at a moment. They knew this case over the teaching of evolution would bring people to town, would be a sensation. And they're, they're right at kind of the heart of this course. What did they know? And part of what they knew was the cultural context of the 1920s. Now, when you folks think of the 1920s, what do you think about? From high school classes, from any other general knowledge you have, the Roaring Twenties, what do you know? Oh, wait, we've got to get a mic over to you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. What do you know? Um, the Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby. And Great Gatsby, you know, lavish parties of the rich and the kind of a, the, 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 those great moments. How about over here? Uh, prohibition and a lot of like gangs in New York, like Al Capone. Well, that's Chicago, but yes, absolutely prohibition. And the idea that although alcohol was banned, people were still drinking. And there's speakeasies in the cities where people, are, all this stuff is going on, which, you know, today there's all these bars that build themselves as speakeasies because in retrospect, it seems kind of cool. But you think of the 20s as this moment of wealth and parties and speakeasies and jazz and dance crazes. And that's all partially true. But there is also a lot going on in a deeply divided country in the 1920s. Huge cultural rifts. And the folks in Frank Robinson's drugstore knew that. This trial is going to land right on one of those fault lines. Let's talk about those. This is what we do with all our trials, and use them as a window <laughs> onto a wider world. In 1920, the United States Census announced that for the first time, more Americans lived in cities than rural areas. And for all of American history until that time, the country, if you needed to win an election, you needed to get right with the farmers. But as farms became pr more productive, to the McCormick Reap and other things, we didn't need as many farmers. Farmers are moving into the cities. And there's this sense among some people in rural areas that they, who were considered kind of the heart of the American story, Thomas Jefferson's chosen children of God, were being supplanted by an urban story. And a place where living in the city seemed like an increasingly sophisticated thing to do and farmers who once had been seen as the backbone of America are portrayed by some in the cities as kind of rubes. And there is a growing urban-rural divide. And it's going to play out in a lot of ways. So 
Cities in the late 19th century, people went there because there were jobs. Immigrants went there because that's where they landed. But they were tough. The, the, the number of people arriving completely overwhelmed their infrastructure, pollution, sewage problems, horse manure everywhere. It was not pretty. But as a result of a movement known as the progressive movement at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, cities had been cleaned up. Improvements in housing and sewers and parks and playgrounds and sanitation and changes in the form of government to make them more efficient. And germ theory being applied to clean up cities. You can see the difference down here on East Houston Street in New York before and after the progressives. And in addition, in the 1920s, cities were electrified. Although only one in 10 farm families in the 20s had electricity, in the cities almost everybody did. And it's going to spur demand. This is part of what's going to make the 20s economy roar for a whole host of new labor-saving devices that if you were lived in the cities, you could use because you had electricity. Electric toasters and refrigerators and vacuum cleaners and record players. And it just seemed like a very kind of exciting place to live because there was all these things, labor-saving devices you could buy and entertainment devices. None more important than the radio. Today you think of a radio as an old technology, but the idea in the 20s that you could turn on a box in your living room and hear the news from Europe and sporting events and live events, one of which will be the first trial in American history broadcast on the radio, the Scopes trial, was intoxicating. And the cities increasingly seem sexy. Times Square, someone walking into Times Square, that's exciting. The electrified ads of Times Square. Adding to the cultural sophistication will be a movement that explodes in the 1920s as the result of the first wave of great African-American migration out of the South and into northern cities. More than a million African-Americans moved north during and after World War I whereas most 90% of African Americans had lived in the South in 1900. That now starts the change. And with it is going to come some significant racial tension as African Americans move into neighborhoods that had been white neighborhoods. But also a dramatic outpouring of arts and music. When you lived in the sharecropping South, down long roads from your nearest neighbors, creative people didn't often find their other people who shared their interests. But as African Americans move into neighborhoods like Harlem and U Street in DC, there's this moment of cultural explosion that is going to lead to the poetry of Langston Hughes and the music of Billie Holiday and Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway and the novels and, uh, of Zora Neale Hurston, which are going to kind of change the American literary and music landscape, known as the Harlem Renaissance, although it plays out in a lot of cities, Detroit and Chicago and other places. If you've been down to U Street in DC, that was kind of the Harlem Renaissance neighborhood around Howard. And look at the, look at the plaques on the houses. And you're going to see, here's where Duke Ellington lived. And, and you, you'll see it. U Street in the 20s. And part of this will be the rise of jazz. Jazz born in New Orleans, but it takes on an even a new, different, urban, sophisticated feel in Detroit and Chicago and New York. And it will be music 
that is going to become America's national music, particularly intoxicating to young people. Young white college students love jazz. Jazz is going to fill the music of the speakeasies and give the name through F. Scott Fitzgerald to the whole period as the Jazz Age. And included in this urban world will be the rise of a new type of woman known as the flapper or flappers. And these were hip, young, urban women who wore their hair short and short skirts, who danced, who smoked, who drank despite prohibition, and flouted sexual conformity. Many of you have seen the flapper image before. Some of you whose families resided in the United States in the 20s look back in your old photo albums. There may be a flapper in your family tree. And the flapper image is everywhere. Smoking, flapper, you get the idea. Yeah. And it crossed racial lines, flapper style African Americans. This is a Howard football game in the 20s. And while most women did not become flappers, Advertising, which booms in the 20s, this is the great age of Madison Avenue, likes, always likes edgy stuff. They know it appeals particularly to younger demographics, and the flapper image is everywhere. And the 20s was the rise of Hollywood and movies, and in the great movie palaces of the cities, and even in those small towns that got theaters, because the, the town had electricity, there's a lot of movies that project this urban style and sophistication, including Clara Bow, who often played flapper characters, some of which some people found very edgy. You recall from our lecture on the Lizzie Borden case, the layers of clothing that counted for respectability in the Victorian era, which is just 20 years before this, even, you know, even up to 1910. You remember this. And suddenly, we have this. And the movie palaces, and the small theaters, and some parents are going to see this, and they're not going to like it. All right, even the small, some small towns get theaters. And as part of this cultural contest in which the Scopes trial is going to sit, as you mentioned, was prohibition, which had been passed by folks like Lizzie Borden's Women's Christian Temperance Union, and who believed that stamping out alcohol would end domestic violence and poor families squandering their wages and bring order to the city where a lot of these immigrants seemed to be spending time in saloons and drinking, but also what you know is going to be in the cities a titanic failure. Instantly, speakeasies arise, police are paid off, winking and nodding, and prohibition never really works. Warren Harding's throwing liquor parties at the White House. And to the shock of some, it's going to turn the folks who supplied the alcohol to the speakeasies, like Al Capone and the Mafia, into cult heroes. And with all of this cultural change, inevitably, there'll be a backlash. And a backlash from people who got to the crowded cities, particularly if they had left rural areas because the being kind of pushed out of farm life found them deeply threatening and alienating places. And the 1920s is going to see a boom, a rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan, which had originally been created during Reconstruction to fight 
reconstruction policy, but then had gone kind of into remission after 1877 when white supremacy again begins to be restored, is going to rise once more. And this time, its targets will not just be African Americans and their uh, Republican allies, but it's going to be immigrants, Catholics, loose women, union members, Jews, flappers, supporting prohibition, and it's going to be everywhere. Four million members from Maine to Oregon. Chicago had 50,000 Klan and 50,000 members. Klan on Long Island. And part of what added to the Klan's ferocity was that the 20s came at the end of the Ellis Island era of immigration, from which many of you in the room are descended. From 1890 to 1920, 18 million immigrants coming from places where the streams of immigration hadn't come from before, Eastern Europe, Russia, Poland, 3 million Jews, 4 million Italian Catholics, etc. And part of the reaction was to this, to people who believed that these people would not be true Americans. And the Klan is in Colorado and Portland. And the leaders were trying to turn back the clock to a world where white Protestant men ran the show. And African Americans, Jews, and Catholics either knew their place or were not around. And they will paint Catholics as people who were bad for democracy because the Pope would tell them how to vote, and Jews as part of an international conspiracy of financiers. And the Klan was trying to restore the small town values of white Protestant America in a new world of decadent and ethnically diverse cities. And startling scenes, clans marching down Roland Avenue in Baltimore, 1925. Songs, Daddy Stole Our Last Clean Sheet and Join the Ku Klux Klan. A 50,000 person clan march in the middle of Washington, DC. Now, also, Intertwined is this idea in the 20s known as nativism. Now, not all nativists were Klansmen. All Klansmen almost certainly were nativists. But nativists were people who believed it was time to cut off open immigration. And they opposed any further immigration into the United States of Asians, Jews, Italians, Catholics, Eastern Europeans. And by the middle of the 1920s, they are going to find political success with passage of an act known as the Johnson-Reed Act that, is with a complicated formula, is going to cut off immigration from Asia entirely and from most of the world except for Western Europe. also known as the National Origins Act of 1924. The Johnson-Reed Act. On a previous slide, I had a picture of one of the leading nativists of the day, somewhat shockingly, Henry Ford, whose assembly lines in Detroit transformed American factories and productivity. But he was also a vicious anti-Semite and nativism who required all of his workers to subscribe to his newspaper, the Dearborn Independent. 
which had headlines that told favorable stories of the Klan and things like Jewish jazz moron music becomes our national music. And as Calvin Coolidge, the president, signed the Johnson-Reed Act into law, he said America must be kept American. Also, dividing good portions of the country in the 1920s will be an intense religious debate that's going to play right into the heart of what will be the Scopes trial. And on one side of that debate will be religious modernists. And religious modernists, like George Rapelier at Frank Robinson's drugstore, were people who said you could square the Bible with modern science. And note that the Bible was written by humans and contained valid human perceptions of how God acted, but didn't have to be precisely historical or scientifically accurate. That the Bible's ethical and religious teachings were beyond the realm of fact. That you could take the lessons of the Bible without saying the miracles of the Bible were absolutely true religious modernists. So for the Adam and Eve story, you could say that while there might not have been a Garden of Eden, there might be a moment in evolution where we have what would be the first humans, and that could stand in for that story. Bible should be interpreted in the light of modern scientific scholarship. But reacting to this with ferocity would be people who saw religious modernism as a sign that the country was going to hell in a handbasket. And all the disorder and cultural change in the cities was a result of a country losing its faith. And they'll be known as the religious fundamentalists. And they feared that modernism was another sign of America's moral decline. And it had infected the schools and the pulpits. And they now dug in and said, no, nope, the Bible should be interpreted literally. <laughs> this is the famous traveling evangelist, Amy Semple McPherson, who, with her enthusiastic and fiery sermons inspired a lot of people. Also, the traveling evangelist who would draw tens of thousands to his sermons, the Reverend Billy Sunday, who showed up in Tennessee when they were passing the Butler Act to support the Butler Act and said, education today is chained to the devil's throne. And he cheered Tennessee for taking action against the godforsaken gang of evolutionary cutthroats. And the fundamentalists drew their name from a series of books written in 1915 by religious experts known as the Fundamentals, a Testimony to Truth. And Protestant theologians who would outline the tenets of the Protestant faith. And they're gonna, their books are going to provide the name for the movement. And included in those tenets will be the absolute accuracy and divine inspiration of Scripture, the virgin birth of Christ, Salvation solely through Christ's sacrifice, the resurrection story, and the authenticity of biblical miracles. All of which ran headlong into the teachings of Darwin. Some fundamentalists would accept as truth a 17th, the calculations of a 17th century Protestant bishop named James Usher who calculated that the world had begun in 4004 BC. 
So about you know, 6,000 years earlier, rather than the millions that some of the scientists of the day were saying was the time frame of Earth's creation. So we're going to have a struggle here between the theories of Charles Darwin as outlined in The Origin of the Species in 1859 and The Descent of Man in 1871 and a religious movement determined to keep the country from slouching into Gomorrah. And the Butler Act will just be one becomes the most famous of 41 anti-evolution bills in 21 states. And politicians would run on anti-evolution platforms. Which brings us to a central figure in this story. Probably the most famous leader of the anti-evolution in schools movement will be a man who had cast a wide shadow across American history, William Jennings Bryan. From your AP US history, he gave the famous Cross of Gold speech, an advocate for farmers and working people, a populist Democrat, three-time presidential nominee, had served as Secretary of War under Woodrow Wilson, fired, resigned for opposing World War I. He was probably right. That's a war we shouldn't have been in. He will become a key uh, advocate of women's suffrage and help push that through. But he is going to become a leading figure in the campaign to drive teaching of evolution from the public schools. William Jennings Bryan, huge. Everyone would knew William Jennings Bryan. There's me by his statue in the rotunda. Remind me never to do that again. And he did not like Darwin. And reason, well, some of the reasons he didn't like Darwin is he particularly didn't like the way his Darwinian teaching had been used. He accurately believed that part of the German militarism that led to World War I came from the Germans coming to believe that Darwin's principles were part, would play into human society and that the global struggle would be a struggle of survival for the fittest and help cause a war that would cause 16 million deaths. And he didn't like that. Darwin initially never, the term survival of the fittest is coined by a British sociologist, Herbert Spencer, but Darwin will come to use it. And as they applied it to human life, people are going to misuse it. Dar Bryan hated the fact, the great commoner, William Jennings Bryan, that the great wealth of the Gilded Age, this is the Biltmore Mansion, the Vanderbilt's Mansion made, made to look like Versailles in Asheville, that the folks who had that concentrated wealth had come to say, well, this is just survival of the fittest. This is what Darwin said would happen. The, the, the most fit will get the most rewards. And Brian was appalled by that. And he was certainly appalled by a movement that was seeing its heyday in the 1920s, the eugenics movement. And the eugenics movement was led by well-meaning scientific people, famous names like Margaret Sanger, who said, you know what? We see this story of natural selection and how the fittest species survived or the fittest variations survived. And maybe we could improve society, speed that process up by ensuring that the most fit had children, and the less fit did not. And 
and they are going to campaign for, this is, this light flashes every 16 seconds a person is born in the United States, but every 17 and a half minutes a high quality person is born. Some people are born to be a burden on the rest. And the eugenicists in 30 states are going to pass laws influenced by Darwin's teachings that, that allowed forced sterilization of people with intellectual disabilities, epilepsy, deafness, blindness, drug addiction, or those who committed certain crimes, because it was believed that criminal behavior could be inherited. And at least 60,000 forced sterilizations in the 20s, 8,000 in Virginia alone. under the idea of improving the race. And these aren't, this is not rural people reacting to the cities, this is scientists. Here's the Iowa's eugenics law, 1911. It allowed forced sterilization of, quote, idiots, feeble-minded drunkards, drug fiends, epileptics, syphilitics, moral and sexual perverts, and it made mandatory as to criminals who have been twice convicted of a felony. Forced sterilization. And this is two years after the Scopes case, but I just want to give you a sense of how mainstream this came. 1927, the Supreme Court hears a case of a woman whose mother had been institutionalized. She was put in a foster home while there, got pregnant when the foster home's nephew raped her. But she was then put into a foster home. And because the mother, uh, she was then put into an institution. And because they said that she's showing these same traits as her mother, they required that she be forcibly sterilized before she could be released. The case went to the United States Supreme Court, and there, one of our greatest jurists, Oliver Wendell Holmes, great proponent of the First Amendment and other things, will finish his opinion upholding Virginia's eugenics law, saying, it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, Society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles is enough. Decision held step toward a super race. What historical event makes you somewhat uncomfortable? about attempts to create a super race. I think we all can guess. Forced sterilization. And William Jennings Bryan would say, Darwin's dreadful law of hate is replacing the Bible's divine law of love, which treated all souls as sacred, whether you have epilepsy or not. And he says he will lead this drive to prohibit teaching of Darwin's theories in public schools. And he, like Butler, will defend this as democratic. The people who write the, paycheck, who write the checks should decide what the schools teach. And if you think this is a remote question, this, we're in the middle of that right now. There's all kinds of people who want parents' rights to say what's taught in schools. This is a continuing story in American life. But what about non-fundamentalists who want to learn Darwin's teachings? He says Protestants, Catholics, and Jews share creationist views. And if atheists want to teach atheism, they can build private schools. And again, he says, we're not demanding the teachers teach Christianity. We simply insist that they shall not, under the guise of either science or philosophy, teach evolution as fact. And would add, and he would quote Thomas Jefferson, 
who said to compel a man to furnish funds for the propagation of ideas he disbelieves and abhors is tyrannical. And he says, teachers can still teach about evolution of other species, but when it comes to man, God's miracles trump science. God makes the laws of science, and he can change them when he wants to. All right. Critics say he's denying children access to the tree of knowledge. And the Scopes trial is going to be laying right in the middle of all this. May 25th, 1925. Grand jury. Remember from our previous discussions, you have to have a grand jury to indict someone. They hold the grand jury. Seven of Scopes students who had been in the biology class he briefly taught the previous spring are going to testify that he taught evolution. And Scopes is actually going to coach them how to testify. We, I want to be indicted here. And he is. And they set the evolution trial in Dayton for July 10th. And they wanted to get publicity here. So the organizers are actually invited to serve on the defense team the great British evolutionist and science fiction writer, H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds, but he declines. But they're going to get a gold mine when William Jennings Bryan, hearing that this is happening, a former lawyer who hadn't practiced law in 30 years, says, I want to be a part of this first great test case on anti-evolution laws, and volunteers to lead the prosecution. Now they've got a famous name in Dayton, and this thing is going to explode. There's Brian arriving in Dayton. And in particular, because a nemesis of William Jennings Bryan, Clarence Darrow, the nation's most famous defense attorney, who had defended gangsters and others, and had just won, saved two uh, murderers in the city from the electric chair in a famous case, Leopold and Loeb, which you could Google, and a famed agnostic will offer his services for free to the defense team. Now, the ACLU, who was running the defense, didn't want Darrow because they knew Darrow was going to go after religion. They want this to be a First Amendment case, a free speech case. But Scopes says, I want Darrow. And now you've got the nation's most famous defense attorney and this three-time candidate for president, William Jennings Bryan, squaring off in Dayton. And this trial, which they thought was going to be big, will be bigger than they could ever imagine, both at the moment and in its historical legacy. And we will pick up that story on Thursday. Thanks for listening to this week's Lectures in History podcast. To find even more history content, visit c-span.org slash AHTV.